Hello, you're watching a lesson on creating a vCloud lab. In this lesson, we're going to go over why you'd want to build a vCloud lab and then some ways to build a vCloud lab. It's important to understand the why because it's not necessarily difficult to build one, but you have to have some reasons why you'd want to go through the process of building a vCloud lab. After all, it's not necessarily easy. It takes some effort, takes some money. Uh, it's an investment in you and your future. So what's the reason you'd want to build a vCloud lab? I would advise it because it's a great way to reinforce the learning that you're doing here with these lessons. You're hearing and seeing ways to leverage vCloud Director, but having the ability to do as well, to have a live environment where you can really practice what you're learning, reinforces that knowledge. It's going to boost your retention and give you more practical skills that you can then reproduce in the workplace. Additionally, sometimes breaking things and doing them the wrong way first gives you the best way forward to do it the right way. I know I've managed to install stuff incorrectly or misinterpret instructions multiple times. You know, it's just normal. I think we all do. And having a lab gives you the ability to break things. And it's not in production, so no one knows. So it's a safe environment where if you do cause things to explode, no one's the wiser. Additionally, a lab gives you the ability to explore specific features or maybe you have a design in mind that's very specific. You want to try this specific application. You can then do that in your lab and see exactly how it's going to react in a real environment. I'll also comment that if you go on the internet and you look up how to build a lab, you're going to get ridiculous amounts of results. Everyone has a different opinion on exactly how you build a lab. And it can get kind of personal. There's a lot of opinions, we'll say, where people defend what's a good lab, what's a bad lab. And even I've contributed to those different discussions through various posts and such. So we'll put it this way. In my opinion, a good lab is one that solves the problems that you have and fulfills your goals. If your goal is just to play with vCloud Director, then the lab should reflect that. If you need a full-on featured lab with all sorts of hardware and blinking lights and network gear, then that's your goal and you need that kind of lab. What I build in my lab will not necessarily work for you. And there is no right or wrong way. There is no only way. There's just the way that works. So let's talk about that for a bit. There's kind of three different types of labs that I see. These different ways of building your lab kind of start at the cheap and easy and move all the way to the large and expensive. The first one, a VMware workstation. That's where you buy VMware's product called VMware Workstation. And you install it on your physical desktop, maybe your laptop and you use that to virtualize workloads. And this is nice because you really don't have to buy any hardware. You already own a desktop or a laptop, I would hope. All you're doing is buying a piece of software. What you might need to do is invest in some more memory. Typically, I advise no less than eight gigabytes of memory for your desktop or laptop. And especially in a laptop, you're probably gonna need to upgrade to a solid state drive. Laptops more commonly ship with a slower 5400 RPM SATA drive which is really not going to perform at the level that you're going to expect when you're running three or more virtual machines. One other nice thing about having VMware Workstation as your lab is that it's on demand. You turn it on when you need it, you turn it off when you don't. Moving up from that, another option is to buy a physical server and run ESXi on it. This would be a dedicated piece of hardware that you use specifically for your lab. Now the nice thing here is you can really adjust how you want to build this server to make it really good for your lab. And by that I mean maybe you want a ton of memory in your lab. You want this box to have 32 gigs of RAM and maybe that's not possible in your laptop. So you could do that with a dedicated physical box. And in the grand scheme of things buying one server is really not that expensive. You also avoid really the need to have a bunch of networking gear because one physical server with virtual machines on it can talk inside of itself. The VMs can talk to each other. Or if you want to do, use different VLANs, you could potentially install a virtual machine that does the routing for you. Now the, the last tier of your own lab is what I call a server farm. And really by that I just mean it has two or more physical servers. This is the most expensive way to go, but it's also the most realistic because you're going to need networking gear and a storage array and so on. You're going to need a more realistic environment where there's challenges in that. It's, it becomes more difficult to do the networking piece and provide the layer 2 and layer 3 networking configuration. You're going to have to set up a storage array. You're going to have to design around those items. 
but it is more realistic. You'd have to overcome those challenges in most enterprise environments too. One thing I will caution, because I have a home lab, it's sitting in my, my home office, and I had to go through some similar things, is make sure to talk to the people who live in your house, your family, uh, and if you have kids, this may be a special consideration too, that it takes up a certain amount of size, it's a little noisy, it produces heat and takes up power. And we want to make sure that everyone's on board of what is this thing that's running in the corner and making all this noise. You know, make sure the kids don't think it's a Lego set. <laughs> they try to disassemble it for you. So just be courteous and make sure everyone's on board. They know what it is and express the value. This is how you're going to learn for your career, maybe for certifications, and it's going to be an investment in you. And I find that typically works well. It has a good message. So let's move on to the vCloud Director appliance. The vCloud Director appliance is a packaged virtual appliance that VMware provides for you to evaluate vCloud Director. It's not meant for production, and in fact, if you install it for a production workload, support's going to kind of thumb the nose at you and say, this is really not the way you should be doing it. But it is an easy way to get started with vCloud Director. Now, I'll, I'll pause for a moment and say, this isn't a shortcut to working with vCloud Director. You still need to know exactly how to install vCloud Director on a Red Hat server. So you'll need to know how to install it the normal way. You'll need to know how to configure the database and all that good stuff. Those are important skills to have. But with that said, the appliance is a good way after you've mastered those skills or if you're doing it in your VMware workstation lab where you have a very limited amount of memory and room for virtual machines, this thing is a great way to get started with vCloud. I'll walk you through exactly how you get the product evaluation so that you can download the OVA, which is the Open Virtualization Appliance, that will be deployed into your lab. Okay, so now we're on the VMware website, and all I've done is gone to vmware.com, then I went to the product section and chose vCloud Director. And this is the page that you'll roughly be greeted with. It may change between now and then, but this is uh, what you're going to see. And in the bottom left corner, you'll find the Download Free Trial button. So click that. And I've already gone ahead and logged into the website just to avoid having to show you my super secret account information on video. But in this area where it says, Welcome Chris W., it would have an area saying, Do you want to log in with a current account or make a new account? If you don't have one, go ahead and make a new account. And if you have one, go ahead and log in. At that point, you'll be asked to agree to the licensing necessary to evaluate vCloud Director. And you'll get 60 days to do so. I've gone ahead and started that evaluation. Obviously, I've been working with the, the product for the videos. And I have 34 days out of the 60 remaining. Now, when I scroll down here a little bit, I'm in the License and Download tab. There's all these different tabs right here. This is really what we're interested in, is downloading the files necessary. So first you've got the licenses for both vCloud Director and the vCloud Network and Security, which was formerly vShield, available to you. So if you can't remember what they are, or you lose the email or whatever, they're always going to be right here ready to go. These evaluation keys will expire on a very specific date, 60 days after you start the evaluation, and it's listed right here. For me, April 10th, these keys will become garbage. If you scroll down a little more, you see the download packages that are available, or the packages that you can download. And there's two that we're interested in, uh, being the VMware vCloud Director 5.1.1 OVA file. This is going to be the open virtualization format appliance that we're going to grab that'll have all the vCloud Director goodies baked into it. So we'll want to start downloading that. I'm going to click manually download because I don't want to mess around with a download manager on this virtual machine. So we're just going to do it the old school way, manual download. I'm going to save the file. And then you'll probably want to go ahead and grab the vCloud and Network and Security uh, Manager right here. This is also an OVA that you can grab, and you can click manually download, and that will uh, be downloaded to your machine so that you can deploy it into the vSphere environment. So I'll go ahead and click that, manual download, we'll save it. Oop. We'll go ahead and save that one too. So you're looking at roughly 1.3, it's right here, 1.4 gigabytes of data for the vCloud Director OVA and 1.3 gigabytes of data for the vCloud Network and Security OVA. So it may take you a while depending on your internet connection. But fortunately, I have the magic voodoo of video, and I can skip all the way to the end where we've got the files downloaded. 
All right, so we've skipped ahead, and I've downloaded the two files. And here they are on my desktop, the vShield Manager OVA and the vCloud Director OVA. Now, we're just focusing on the vCloud Director in this lesson, but it's good that you went ahead and downloaded vShield for later. So now let's go into the vSphere client, and I'll show you how to actually make use of this vCloud Director OVA file. So here I've got the vSphere client into my management cluster. It's called Lab inside the data center called Home Lab. And I've made a folder called Demo just so we can watch the process of installing this particular OVA. Now to start with, you'll go to the file menu up here and you'll choose deploy OVF template. You might be thinking, wait a minute, I thought this was an OVA. Where's that button? Well, there is no button that specifically says OVA. It says OVF, which is the open virtualization file format. It's going to work interchangeably in this event. So you browse, it's on my desktop. Here's the file. This is what it's going to look like roughly. The build number right here might change a little bit. It's basically just saying this is the version 5.1.1.0. This is the specific build, and that it's an OVA file. If you don't see the file for some reason, make sure that the file type has OVA listed. I know there's some imports where it chooses between OVF and OVA, so just make sure that shows up. Click Open and Next. Now it's going to give you some information about the file that you're trying to import. It says it's vCloud Director, which we kind of assume that. <laughs> it's version 5.1.1.0, which was in the file name, so that checks out. And the download size of 1.3 gigs is what I had to download. So that all checks out. The question then becomes size on disk, 2.3 gigs for thin provision or 30 gigs for thick provision. Now, you should have a good idea what these different terms mean uh, from your vSphere background, but we'll go over it really quick in that 2.3 gigs thin provision means we're going to thinly provision that file on our storage, uh, which basically equates to it's a 30 gig disk from a provisioning standpoint, but we're only going to write 2.3 gigs of data to the array. Potentially, this is very handy in a lab environment because disk is kind of a premium for me. I don't have a whole ton of disk laying around in my lab, and I would imagine you probably don't either. So I typically go thin for the lab. 30 gig thick provision means that we're going to reserve and allocate all that space right up front, all 30 gig. No one else can touch it or use it. This may be good when you're actually doing it on your storage array at work uh, for a proof of concept or a test. But again, in the lab, it just eats up a lot of disk. So we're going to use thin. Make sure to read all of the licensing agreement. I'm going to speed read it really quick. And good. Okay, I agree to that. I'm going to click accept and next. And now we get to name the virtual machine. Just to make it easier on my noodle, I'm going to call it the vCloud Director Appliance. And that way I know this is the appliance virtual machine. And because I started, you see I've got demo selected when we did the import, it automatically chose demo as the folder for the destination. If you didn't choose a folder on the beginning and it's going to put it in the root or some weird folder, that's okay. We can move it later. Now we got to choose which host or cluster to put it on. I have DRS running, vSphere DRS, uh, Distributed Resource Scheduler. So I don't get to choose a host so much as just the cluster that I want to put it on and I'm going to put it on the cluster called Lab, which is my management cluster. And then again, we get to choose a resource pool, which you should have a little bit of background on this from the vSphere side, but it's basically a way that we can carve up the physical resources into a pool of logical resources. So a common implementation of this would be resource pools to divide different types of workloads. Maybe you have production and non-production, or database and web things like that. I don't have any resource pools in my lab. All I have is a V app for VC ops, which we can ignore. So I'm just going to click on my lab. And in your lab, it's probably going to be the same. We really don't need a resource pool. Now we need to pick where to put the virtual machine. I have four different data stores available to me. And they have kind of naming that describes what they do. This one is for my ISOs. This one is for my management. A cluster which you don't see here and this one is for my virtual machines so we want to use the one for virtual machines really quick if I look it has 430 gigabytes of free space which is perfect because this virtual machine uses 2.3 gigabytes of space out of the box with a thin provision and up to 30 gigs of space if it's fully thick provisioned it's also NFS which will come in play with the next screen so we'll choose this data store click next 
And then again, I said it's NFS, so thin provision is automatically selected, and there's no way to change the choice. It's all grayed out. That's because by default, NFS can only thin provision. VMFS, I would have the choice of thick provision, either lazy or eager zeroed. But because it's NFS, I can only thin provision. The only way around that is if your storage array vendor had a plugin that would let you thick provision on NFS. So for the sake of this demo, we'll just do thin provision and leave it there. Uh, and make sure, again, that the free space here exceeds the amount of the virtual machine. So because I'm thin provisioning, I need about 2.5 gig. I've got 430. That checks out. We can move on. Now we get to the networking. And now we're starting to get into a little bit of the knowledge around how vCloud Director works. So vCloud Director, and it has a pretty good description here, it's telling you that one network is going to be for the UI, which is the HTTP, and the other one is going to be used for console access to the virtual machines inside the vCloud. There's also a warning saying that the multiple source networks are mapped to the same host network. This is just telling me that here I've got both networks mapped to the same port group, and this is the default one. I don't want to actually put it on this one. I'm going to put it on my lab, my virtual machine port group. This is a port group dedicated to virtual machines in my management cluster. The one just denotes that that's the VLAN it's on. VLAN 1, the name is VMs. So I'll put that one there. And now watch, the, the warning goes away. And when I put this one on VM1, the warning comes back because the port groups are the same. We'll go into the networking piece a lot more in depth in the next lesson. But let's just say this for now. In a lab environment, there's nothing wrong with having them on the same port group in the same VLAN. If we're doing this in a more realistic environment, you would probably want to put them on different VLANs. This gives you isolation of the VLANs and security in that we don't have traffic from one VLAN potentially talking to the other VLAN. It isolates those two networks off, and that also feeds into security. I can't necessarily hijack the console port and get access to the HTTP port. Now finally, we got to answer a lot of questions around the actual configuration of the virtual machine. The first question is, what database do you want to use for vCloud Director? Now in a normal production install, we have to provide one. We have to provide either Oracle or SQL as an external virtual machine. The nice thing about the vCloud Director appliance is we have a choice of internal. There's a little Oracle database baked into it that we can just use. So that's great. If you don't want to use it, I'm not exactly sure why, you know, because you're going through the process of using the appliance, might as well use the internal database. Uh, you can choose external Oracle or SQL. We're going to use internal. Because we're using internal, a lot of these questions, it says skip to the networking properties section if you chose internal. We're going to do exactly that. We're going to skip all this stuff and go right to networking properties. That's kind of cool. You get to skip all that, all those questions around the database. So you'll notice right here it says leave blank if DHCP is desired. That's the dynamic way of assigning IPs in an environment. Now, it's not very common to see DHCP for a server virtual machine. I just don't see it very often. When I do see it, it may be with reservation set up so this virtual machine always gets the same IP. But what better way to guarantee that this VM always gets the same IP than to just hard code it in there? And that's the way I do it, and that's the way I typically see it done in the real world, where we have a name server with a specific name that matches a specific set of IPs, and that's set in stone. We really don't ever want to change that. And that's the way I would recommend doing it. So we're going to do the same thing here. So I'm going to put in my IP information for the default gateway. I'm going to put in my DNS address. And I'm just putting in the IPs here. If I had another one, I only have one, but if I had another one, you put a comma, and then I could put another address here if that existed. It doesn't for me, but I just want to show you how to do it. And then we need a pair of IPs. Let me drag it down here a little bit. The description's pretty handy. It's telling you that you're going to put two IPs, one for IP address network one, one for the network two IP address. The lower address is going to be used for the HTTP access, for the user interface. It's telling you right here, user interface API access to vCloud. The higher address will be used for console access. So just to make it easy on myself, I always put the lower address in the beginning, in the network 1 IP address, and I put the higher one in network 2. That way I, just, I know where they are. Just in my mind, that makes things easier. So we're going to use 10... 0091 here with a class C subnet mask. 
three two five fives and a zero. And we're going to use 10, 0, 0, 92 here with the same subnet mask. So just because I put it in that way, the lower IP is dot 91. We know that's going to be used for the user interface. And the second IP is dot 92. And we know that'll be used for console access. Plus, it kind of makes it easier. I like it when it ends with a 1 right here. Network 1, 91. Network 2, 92. To me, that just helps my brain understand which IP is which. Just makes it work for me. And then the final screen shows you the deployment task and the configuration that you set. So you can walk through. It should match pretty much this list on the left. will be matched with answers here on the right. And that we know it's going to be about 2.3 gig, and we made sure we had space for that. There's the name that it was given and where it's going to live on demo in the lab cluster, which is my management cluster. On my VM's data store with a thin provisioning, here's the network VM1. And then all the answers to the questions right here. It's an internal database, so it just skips on down to here. We've got the gateway address, the DNS, and the two IPs. I typically don't power on after deployment just because I want to make sure everything looks good after it deployed. So I'm going to click Finish. I'm going to let it start deploying. And I think we'll probably, with the magic of video, skip through this and come back to when it's deployed. All right, so it has deployed successfully. Congratulations. A big applaud all around. And we'll click Close. And there it is. Here's your new vCloud Director Virtual Machines, the appliance. You'll notice it's running SUSE Linux, which is different from Red Hat Linux that we would deploy for a production environment. And 5.1.1.0 shows up as the version. So it's very easy to tell exactly what version and build you're running right here. You'll also notice that it uses one vCPU and about two and a half gigs of RAM, which is fine. And it'll say VMware Tools is third party independent. That's important. It means that the tools that were installed are specific to this virtual machine. Uh, so I would advise don't play with that. Don't try to overwrite the tools with the most latest and greatest ones. Just let it be the third party independent mode. And it's not running because it's not powered on. And on the right, you'll see the resources consumed are 2.3 gigs of storage. So that's fine. We expected that. That's what the, the wizard told us. And provision storage is 32.69 gig. You might wonder if you were paying attention very carefully that it said 30 gig for thick provisioning, but here it says 32.69 gig. What's the difference? That's the swap file for the memory. Now see here, the memory is about two and a half gigs, and that's about two and a half gigs over the 30. So that's where the difference is. Additionally, it's on the VM1 network and the VM storage. So everything looks good. I like it. If you needed for some reason to tweak this virtual machine, you could do so now and give it more memory or maybe steal a little bit of memory. I found that the config that it comes in with the one CPU and the two and a half gigs of RAM is pretty much perfect. So we're going to go ahead and power this on. Now, while it's doing the power on option, I'll just show you a little preview of what's going on behind the scenes. If I open the console to the virtual machine, we'll see that it automatically starts configuring itself and installing, you know, what it needs to do on the database and setting up the demons and all that good stuff. It, it's pretty cool to watch it go through and completely configure itself. So here, there's those IPs that I gave it, 91 and 92. It's all being configured for the network. Setting up SSL certificates. And it'll go through and actually bake the database too. So we're not going to watch this whole thing because it takes probably about 10 minutes the first time, but just a, an idea of what it should look like when it powers on. And again, because it is the first time it's booted up, it's got to do a configuration. It will take a little while to get started. All right, so now you've seen how to acquire and deploy the vCloud Director appliance. Let's go into the final piece of building your vCloud lab. And that's the licenses. Because obviously you could download this software all day long and it doesn't do anything if it's not licensed. Uh, or at least it won't fill the needs that we need to be on the free license. One of the requirements to do vCloud Director is we're going to need full enterprise plus level licensing for the vCloud environment. We need distributed switches and DRS. And distributed switches are specifically only available with enterprise plus licensing. So what I'd recommend is go ahead back to that VMware website Grab 60-day trials of all the stuff you see here, vCenter Server, ESXi, vCloud Director, and the vCloud Network and Security, formerly vShield Manager. You're going to need 60-day trial of all this stuff. Here's some tips. First, gather all the licenses at the same time. Don't piecemeal it around. That way, everything's at 60 days. You're not you know, 30 days in, and all of a sudden, your vSphere environment 
you know, dies on you because the licensing's gone. And then 20 days later, your vCloud environment dies on you because the licensing is gone. Just grab it all at the same time and use the same email address. Just have one email address that you use for all four of these licenses. And that way, if you have to go in there and re-download some software or get the key again, you just put in that one email address. You don't have to remember two or three or whatever. And last, I advise making calendar reminders or, or events in your calendar to let you know where you're at in the milestone. So typically what I'll do, as soon as I download a trial, I know it's 60 days out, so I'll make a calendar event for 60 days out that says this is when the evaluation is going to expire. And that way I can set reminders, you know, maybe two weeks prior, one week prior, one day prior, whatever makes sense. And that way I know this is how much time left I have with the environment to learn what I'm trying to learn. So if you're going for a certification or you're trying to look to do some learning for a real deployment, you know this is kind of the drop dead date that I have to get that learning completed before my lab, you know, goes south on me. <laughs> so that's a tip that just makes it easier uh, so that you're not surprised by the fact that the lab has died on you. In addition to that, in the bottom right corner of the vSphere client, and if you're in the web client, I believe it's at the top of the web page, it's going to tell you a countdown when you get close to the end saying your licenses are about to expire. So there's a couple different ways you can be warned of it, but you just don't want to be surprised. That completes the vCloud Director Lab lesson, and I'll see you in the next lesson.